Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Grung. I'm Asbet Bedrosian. In this Conversations on Grung episode, we'll be talking about the constitutionality of the November 9 agreement signed as a ceasefire to end the Second War in Artsakh. We'll also discuss constitutional protections for checks and balances in the government of Armenia and the case against former presidents from a high level. This episode was recorded on Tuesday, January 12, 2021. Since Nikol Pashinyan came to power in 2018 and prior to the Artsakh War of 2020, issues around the Armenian constitution and constitutional court have been at the center of public attention. These issues have been partly fueled by one of the most prominent legal cases in the recent Armenian history, the March 1 trial against Armenian President Robert Kocharyan, and the military leadership of the time. Today, we'll have a conversation on issues surrounding the March 1 case, as well as legal and specifically constitutional questions related to the November 9 ceasefire declaration and subsequent political events. To talk about these issues, we are joined by Aram Vartevanyan, who is author of over 20 scholarly articles in the field of constitutional law, criminal law, and criminal procedural law. He is a PhD in law and is a member of the Chamber of Advocates of Armenia. He is founder and director of JP Law Firm, and from 2011 to 2018, he was in state service at the Ombudsman's Office and at the Constitutional Court. Vartevanyan is a member of Robert Kocharyan's legal team. Hello and welcome, Aram. Hello there. Aram, let's begin with Robert Kocharyan's criminal case. For many of our listeners, it's still a big mystery. So I was wondering if you can start with a very high level and describe what the case is about, its current status, and assume that it's for someone who is not very familiar with it. Okay, so first of all, the main issue that we have with this case is that a lot of people believe that it has a connection with the March 1 events, but in reality, it does not. This may sound absurd to you, but Accusations which are made to Wacharam have nothing to do with the events which happened on March 1, including the death of 10 people, including two police officers and eight civilians. So this is something which I would like to highlight just from the beginning. The accusations towards the president is that, allegedly, the president, who is the guarantor and protector of constitutional order, overthrew the constitutional order himself. This is already again an absurd, because the actions which the president took were only to guarantee safety and public order and constitutional order in Armenia during the events which took place. Because uh, something very similar just happened a few days ago, I would like to make a quick similarity between the two events. We saw what happened in Washington just a few days ago. We've noticed that there were, I don't know, about uh, 2,000 people who attacked the building of Congress of the United States. So they were not armed. They did not have anything with them. They simply attacked the building. Now, just imagine if those people were armed with Molotov cocktails, with various weaponry, with rocks, bricks, etc. And again, such kind of events would take place. Without anything, like without being armed, the 2000 protesters in Washington, when they tried to make their assembly heard, four casualties were made. Four casualties. That is the uh, official estimate at this time. Maybe that number would change. I don't want to make any predictions. Nevertheless, the fact is that there were four casualties in the case when people were unarmed. Now, just imagine if people were armed and if one of them was the first one to murder a police officer, what would be the consequences? I can definitely state that the first action that the president, any kind of president would take would be to have a regime which would protect constitutional order and public order. But these things were the same things which happened in Armenia. But again, we have a big difference there. People were armed with Molotov cocktails and all these things were proven years ago. And no one even tackled this question. Everyone knows about this. However, in 2018, the prosecutor's office and the special investigative service of Armenia, with the direct, uh, let's say, supervision of the prime minister of Armenia, decided to change history. 
decided to change history through an berserk criminal case which was initiated against the second president of Armenia and try to change history in the sense because they were using words such as the protesters were peaceful, that no such events took place. At the same time when there were criminal cases, judgments by courts of Armenia which were never quashed, which suggested the opposite. There is another issue connected with the accusations presented against the president, Robert Kocharem. The article itself, which was, let's say, connected with the president, the article of the criminal code, overthrow of constitutional order. This is the famous article 300.1 of the criminal code. So a lot of people already know this article. And uh, the issue with it is that it doesn't have the legal certainty necessary for a criminal article, because whenever we're talking about a criminally liable offense, the offense itself has to be very certain and very predictable for a person in order to defend his rights, in order to defend his case. Yeah, as but far we as don't I know, have this that was situation. one of the core topics around which the referral to Venice Commission uh, was made. Is that correct? You are definitely correct, and not only to the Venice Commission, but also to the European Court of Human Rights and the Grand Chamber of the Court, and also Venice Commission provided advisory opinions to the Constitutional Court regarding uh, Article 300.1. And I can say, in general, the Court, European Court of Human Rights, and the Venice Commission overall agreed with our position that this kind of article lacks certainty, is not common in European practice because you would not find one country in Europe, in European practice, that has a similar article in their criminal code with such kind of short backs and uh, lack of certainty. You wouldn't find one. This is the only example that we have. And this is we have this term, best European practice. I can definitely say that this article is the worst example of European practice. And this is not only my opinion. I can say that this opinion is also overall shared by the European Court of Human Rights and the Venice Commission. But this is one of the issues that I've raised connected with this article, which is the basis for all this criminal process initiated against Robert Kocharan. I would like to stress out something even more absurd. In the year 2009, when the amendments to the criminal code were made and this article 300.1 was introduced to the criminal code, seven people who were the organizers of all those events which took place in 2008, March 1, which by the way is not seven, but also is eight, because Nikol Pashinyan was the eighth person, but he was let's say, not arrested in 2008. Uh, his whereabouts were unknown for about a year, and that is why the trial was called the trial of seven political active um, persons. So it was called the trial of seven. In that trial of seven, people were also charged with overthrow of constitutional order. And pay attention to this part. When the amendments were made to the criminal code, the courts of Armenia, including the Prosecutor General of Armenia, decided that people cannot be charged with Article 300.1 because Article 300.1 was not in the criminal code in 2008. And because of the prohibition of retroactive force of criminal norms, charges were rejected against those people and were dropped. But the same thing, the same justification was not implemented in the case of Robert Kocharan. What is this if not an absurd in its pure sense? What is this if it's not politically modified trial against Robert Kocharan? Just imagine the same thing, the same arguments were used against Nikol Pashinyan and uh, other seven political actors, Sasun Mikhailian, Alexander Arzumanian, etc. But the same arguments were not implemented in the case of Robert Kocharen. During the trial, we made this motion in order to eliminate, to drop the charges against Robert Kocharen based on the same justifications which were used previously. And the court in Armenia decided to postpone this motion and to keep Robert Kocharen under arrest. Do you see any legal logic here? 
there is another component of the case, uh, corruption, which I guess I'd like you to talk about. But also, what about presidential immunity? As far as I know, there is an immunity clause in the Constitution. And how did the government justify their, their decision to pursue the case, given that clause in the Constitution? You are definitely correct, and this is a very important question, because during 2008 March 1 events, Robert Kochan was the acting president, and being an acting president has the guarantees of immunity, and including the guarantees of functional immunity, which rest with the president even after his term of office is expired. So functional immunity protects presidents in order to have the power to make decisions at, uh, let's say, emergency situations. Now just imagine if any kind of president would not have the guarantee of immunity, the president would not have the even the courage, and this is a logical situation, would not have the courage to make uh, difficult decisions during emergency situations, even wartime situations. Because the president would know that there can be a situation where he can be prosecuted for his actions in acting as a president. The same situation was applicable here. And the government, the prosecutor's office, the investigative service, they simply did not refer, they did not even refer to the question of immunity of the president. This issue was raised at the Constitutional Court, and I was the representative of Robert Kochan at the Constitutional Court regarding the issue of functional immunity of the president, and in this direct case regarding Robert Kochan. The Constitutional Court found that the issues that we raised are unconstitutional, are null and void because there is a legal gap in the criminal procedural code regarding the guarantees and safeguards of the functional immunity of the president. This decision by the Constitutional Court was adopted in September 2019. In the case based on the application of Robert Kocharem. Now, pay attention what happened as a result of this decision. The General Jurisdiction Court of Armenia, presided by Judge Anna Dani Bekian, decided that the decision of the Constitutional Court, based on the application of Robert Kocharyan, and the arguments that the Constitutional Court made in that decision, are not applicable to Robert Kocharyan. This is the level of absurd that we have in this case. And what, what I'm saying are direct quotations from uh, uh, judicial But why acts. aren't they applicable? No justification whatsoever. Simply, they are not applicable to Robert Kocharyan's case. But again, the decision of the Constitutional Court was based on Robert Kocharyan's application regarding Robert Kocharyan's case, and the Constitutional Court found that there is a legal gap which is a violation of human rights, including the right to liberty. However, the court decided that it's not applicable and decided to uh, keep the arrest of Robert Kocharyan intact, in force, and Robert Kocharyan remained um, uh, as a prisoner at that right. time. Okay, uh, uh, thanks Aram. So I'm sure we'll come back to this because I have a question related to constitutional immunity you know, later on. But specifically, what was the other component of the case? The overthrow of constitutional order, and then there's the charge regarding corruption. You know why I haven't even referred to that uh, charge? Because even during this time, the Armenian courts, which did everything possible to violate Robert Kocharyan's rights to fair trial, to his right to liberty, to simply keep him arrested based on only political pure pressure, even at this conditions, the courts did not find that the charges brought on the episode of corruption are valid. So even at this stage, this was the position of courts in Armenia. So that is why I'm not even referring to that question, because it's simply based on a testimony of one entrepreneur, in brackets if I may, a lady, Miss Silva, who presented her purely subjective interpretations of the situation, and even Miss Silva, who is the one person who gave a testimony, and the charges are based only on that testimony, did not mention Robert Kocharyan's name. She did not say that she had a direct connection with him. So even at this stage, 
at this political situation with all the issues that we've seen with the judiciary, our courts did not find these charges to be uh, valid in a way. So that's why I don't see any ne necessity to refer to those charges. Let's say these charges are the pure uh, fantasy of the prosecutors and investigators, again, based on the mm, political pressure by the government. As I understand it, Ms. Silva has also been involved in similar allegations against other individuals. Of course, and there is not even one case which has been proven at this time. But, but how much, like how much is the amount? Because it surely has, has to be in the billions, right? <laughs> if I'm joking. But... <laughs> and this is something that I can mention. It's uh, about one million, one million and a half. This is the amount of money that Miss Silva was referring to in okay, this I mean... in this charge, by the way. Right. And by the way, because you said about the billions, I would like to stress this situation as well. During this two and a half years or even three years, the Armenian government, the Central Bank of Armenia, Investigative Service, uh, National Security Service, all the bodies that you can even imagine or you can't even imagine were trying to prove that Robert Kocharan has these billions, etc. And eventually the result is that he does not have that kind of amount of money, that he does not even have anything close to that kind of amount of money, and there is not even one allegation that the amount which is let's say, present at the bank accounts of Robert Kocharan is connected with any illegal activity. But what I want to stress is the legend and the mythological approach regarding billions which Robert Kocharan has, has been proven to be absent by the current government because they did everything possible to try to prove this. Because this was something that the first person who said was Nikol Pashinyan years ago. So he did everything possible to prove that he wasn't simply making um, defamation or a libel in the case of Robert Kocharan, but he failed. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to bring that up because a lot of people still associate those claims uh, with Robert Kocharan. And if there's any truth to that or if there's any legal other cases that, we are, that you're aware of, let us know. So currently, I, I know during the war, many of the cases were on hold. But is the case continuing today and uh, what is the current status? The current status is that there are several motions that we presented which have not been discussed by the court because of the wartime situation, especially because, for example, Robert Kocharyan, Seyran Ohanyan, General Seyran Ohanyan, by the way, we have in this case two generals, high star generals, let me put it this way, which are um, going through this t trial as people who have the status of an accused, with Robert Kocharan, by the way. And uh, this was something which we can try to connect with the events which happened in starting from September 27. We don't have many high star generals. Now just imagine if there is a country which knows that there is always the risk of an imminent war, that we have enemies at our border, and now just imagine when you have very few that kind of high-level generals who were directly participating in the first Artsakh war, who were not only participating, but the, were ones who were winning the war. And these people were simply, let's say, paralyzed from the situation which was happening in Armenia because they were put under trial. So what was the pure incentive for doing this? At least we can make an allegation that this might have been planned from the beginning. Because Yuri Khachatur of Seyran Ohanyan, these are people who were very feared, highly feared, by the enemy. Because they knew what kind of generals there were, they knew what kind of wartime generals there were. they were. And uh, they were simply put aside from everything in order simply to be an accused in this bizarre, absurd criminal case. We are at the stage of presenting motions and the next hearing is set on January 19. And uh, after our motions will be exhausted, we will pass to a different stage of the criminal trial, which will be, for example, analyzing the evidences, etc. And I can say that there are about more than 800 testimonies in the criminal case 
which is again an example of an absurd criminal case because just imagine that many testimonies and not one of them even mentions the name Robert Kocharyan. Not even one of them mentions the name Yuri Khachaturov, etc. Aram, where do you expect this to go in the future and how do you wind this down? I don't see any future with this criminal case because this is not even a criminal case in its, uh, let's say, pure form. This is simply political prosecution, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which has nothing to do with the law or with human rights. And I can say that even after the events which happened with the Constitutional Court, which were, in my subjective opinion, directly connected with Robert Kocharyan's case, because the wish to change the members of the Constitutional Court had a direct connection with Robert Kocharyan's case. Mm -hmm. If the Constitutional Court rejected our applications, I can definitely state that you would not see any problem with the uh, government and the Constitutional Court. The so-called problems started when the Constitutional Court found our valid judgments, our obvious justifications as correct and found issues unconstitutional, and including the Article 300.1, which was pending at the Constitutional Court, was one of the issues that they decided to change the members of the Constitutional Court. And despite these actions, the Constitutional Court, with its new members, is still examining the case 300.1 of the uh, Criminal Code of uh, Republic of Armenia. So in March, April, there's the possibility that the Constitutional Court would pass a judgment on the situation regarding the constitutionality of Article 300.1 of the Criminal Code. And if our justifications, and I can say that the justifications presented by uh, the Venice Commission and the European Court of Human Rights in their advisory opinions came to support our justifications. So if the Constitutional Court would agree with our party, with Venice Commission, with the European Court of Human Rights, I can say that the result would be that Article 300.1 would be found unconstitutional and as a result of it, the criminal trial has to stop immediately. Uh, and even if let's say the political pressure on courts, on prosecutors, would at least minimize, the result would be again to eliminate this criminal case, to drop the charges, because we had the similar precedent already in force, and no one has changed it, by the way, regarding the trial of Seven and Mikol Pashinyan as well. Because Article 300.1 was found by our courts, by the prosecutor's office, not to be applicable because of the prohibition of the retroactive force of criminal norms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So ever since the signing of the ceasefire declaration on November 9, the Armenian opposition, religious leadership and large segments of society have been critical for the past two months since then. And despite Prime Minister Pashinyan's denials, Armenian and Azerbaijani military teams have even been negotiating on the process of demarcating and delineating international borders between countries. Since the fall of Soviet Union, the two countries haven't recognized their borders. Although the November 9 agreement did not say anything about recognizing international borders, mm -hmm. it appears that there are some unwritten agreements that are committing the Prime Minister to this process. So what is your thought about the actions of uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan since November 9, including the signing, including the changes to the borders? Is the authority to change those borders vested in a single person or does the parliament have to agree to it? What are your thoughts on the legality of everything that has happened since then? Uh, my thoughts are that the events which are taking place have nothing to do with legality of or constitutionality because the constitution definitely requires that anything, even a small detail of changes of the Armenian state borders have to be conducted through the parliament or through a referendum, by the way. These actions, of course, we do not see happening in practice. We have even seen that the prime minister officially stated that the changes which are happening in the borders of Armenia, for example, in Sunik Mars or in Gerar Kuniki Mars, all those things are happening based on the oral agreement between the Prime Minister of Armenia and the President of Azerbaijan. So this is something which is already a pure ground to start a criminal case against the Prime Minister. 
But because we have seen the actions which have taken place throughout this two or three years by the prosecutor's office, we can definitely state that uh, we do not even have a lawful prosecutor's office because they are simply purely politically motivated and are under the direct supervision of the Prime Minister. Although the Constitution requires that the Prosecutor General and the Prosecutor's Office have to be purely independent from any state body. But we see the reality totally different. These actions are not only unlawful, which are being made starting from uh, November 9, but they are also simply in the field, in the region of the criminal code. These actions are not something which can be acceptable. So what if I give you the hypothetical argument, the prime minister would, or someone in that position would say, I did not agree to change the borders, this is not demarcation or delineation, but it's only a verbal agreement to uh, pull the troops back and for the Azerbaijan to pull their troops forward. Effectively, the border does change, but would such an argument fly in the court where, you know, he says, now I, you know, I'm going to cede, I'm going to let Azerbaijani troops occupy Sunik, for instance, but this is not an official document. This is not an official recognition. It's just my own actions of the military. What happens then? And Hovig, uh, well, let me add one more thing. Because the borders have never before been fully defined and determined, then maybe the argument could be that he could not possibly be changing borders that have not been defined before. I can come from the first question and then to Osbeth's question. So, of course, it cannot fly in courts or anywhere. Because the sad thing is that although we do not have an official document, we only have a verbal agreement, that international law is also being interpreted through state practice. So if the country, even based on a verbal agreement, conduct actions which make it a reality, which make it the policy and the will of the state, a reverse from that situation is almost impossible. So if, for example, it's only a verbal agreement, then it can't have any legal consequences. While we see consequences fully in effect, fully. So anything which the Azerbaijani party requires, verbally, or I don't know how, becomes a reality. This is something which is not even heard in international practice. We have seen different types of wars uh, around the world but not one which can be, let's say, ended this way. Based on verbal agreements, the borders of Armenia are being narrowed down. And the horrifying thing is that it is being narrowed down based on the wish and will of the Armenia's current government. Because, of course, verbal agreements should not have legal consequences, but in this case they do. And a reverse from this legal consequences is almost impossible because just imagine Azerbaijan or any other country can say that, you know, Armenia has already implemented its will. They took their troops back and allowed the troops of the other country to come forward, which means a factual situation already changed based on the will of the Armenian government, which doesn't have that kind of power, by the way. Right. Not if one person is vested with such kind of power and cannot be vested with that kind of power. Osbert, can you please remind me your question? My question was a follow-up on the thought that Hovig was expressing, that because there have not ever been ah, yes, fully defined borders, then he could not yes, be changing yes. borders. You see, this argument is not correct. It's not valid. I do not share that argument that Armenia's borders were not... Uh, clarified or accepted, etc. Armenian borders were accepted because Armenia is a sovereign state which has been recognized by almost all countries around the world. And by being recognized, the borders were also recognized. You would not see one international document which would make a reservation regarding Armenia's borders. You would not find that kind of document. You might find a document uh, regarding Artsakh, but you cannot find anything connected with Armenia. And Armenia's borders, therefore, were fully and internationally accepted. Aram, do we have a situation where the parliament could actually reject the agreements that are being signed by the prime minister? Well, we could. We could. In November 10, I made a public statement regarding the situation. I explicitly stated that the November 9 document is, at this moment, 
unconstitutional and that actions have to be taken in that direction. However, getting back to my first answer to Hobik's question, an opposition to this argument can truly and validly justify that Armenia has already accepted the terms which were signed on November 9, even without the parliament, but the state itself, by the actions of the government, has already given legal force to it. A full legal force, by the way. Again, this is something coming from international law. State practice is a source of interpretation of international norms, agreements, declarations, etc. And we have a state practice which is, although overthrowing our constitutional order, and this is very interesting because the first actions that Nikol Pashinyan's government took was to start a criminal case against Robert Kocheran regarding overthrow of constitutional order, and they themselves, in pure legal sense, conducted various episodes of overthrow of constitutional order. The thing that they tried to connect to Robert Kocharan, which was not even 1% justified, they did it themselves 100% justified with the actual events that we see. You might remember what happened in 2009, uh, June, if I'm not wrong. The Prime Minister of Armenia, through his Facebook page, literally asked people to blockade courts. In 2018, the Prime Minister of Armenia literally asked people to blockade the building of parliament. By the way, something very interesting. Facebook, Twitter, not any of the social networks decided to act against this action. Unlike so today we see, in Washington. Of course. So we see an example of double standards again. You might even have a chance to look at the uh, videos, Facebook Live videos, if I can say it this way, by the Prime Minister of Armenia on November 10, when he literally called people to start a revenge against the people who were the so-called previous people at the government. He literally said, I can say it in Armenian, Did you see anything similar stated by, for example, Donald Trump in his Facebook or Twitter account? Not even close to the degree of aggressiveness, hate speech, provided by the Prime Minister. And his Facebook account was not even temporarily freezed. I'm not saying, by the way, that a criminal case should have been initiated against these statements, because I've already said that we don't have a prosecutor's office or an investigative service in Armenia. Let's move on. Ever since November 9, the calls for Nikol Pashinyan's resignation have grown. And my question was, is a vote of no confidence in the National Assembly the only way to remove an acting prime minister? And if not, what about a hypothetical scenario where the prime minister is under a criminal investigation? You know, we, we talked about constitutional immunity. Could Robert Kocharan's case act as a precedent for making exceptions to constitutional immunity in certain cases? And could that apply to the current circumstances? The interesting thing is that the prime minister of Armenia is not vested with any kind of immunity. Therefore, a criminal prosecution against him can start at any second but it would have started on November 10 immediately, or, for example, after the statement that uh, the borders of Armenia are changed based on oral agreements, verbal agreements, or when the accusations regarding the $5 billion passed from Aliyev to Nikol Pashinyan was made, they, after this kind of accusations, the only logical consequence would have been the arrest of the prime minister. And of course, that would also be the result of suspension of the powers of the prime minister. But again, we are getting back to the situation that our criminal authorities, criminal procedural bodies are directly politically motivated and are under the direct supervision of the government of Armenia. So that's why we do not see that case happening. Therefore, the only valid mechanism is through a vote of no confidence by the parliament to the prime minister. But another interesting thing, do you know that martial law by Nikol Pashinyan is still being kept in Armenia? After November right. 9, we, all of us know that there are no military actions, no more armed attacks on the borders of Armenia or Artsakh. So at this case, why is the martial law kept? Another logical thing. Martial law 
while is being kept in Armenia, has no limitations whatsoever for people. So all the restrictions that were provided by martial law on September 27, all of that has been removed. All of that. However, martial law, de facto, and de jure is being kept. And the only reason for it is that during martial law, a vote of no confidence cannot be presented to the prime minister. So a logical question should arise. Isn't this usurpation of power? Isn't this overthrow of constitutional order in order simply to eliminate the parliament's right to start a process of a vote of no confidence? Of course it is. Yeah, I think the, the, there is no time limit on the martial law. <clears throat> of course there isn't, but it's, uh, yeah. but it's based on logic. It's based on logic. You can't keep martial law when you don't have war. When you can go and sit with the president of Azerbaijan in Moscow during the table, you can greet each other, you can have a press conference with each other, and you can keep martial law. Let me give you a devil's advocate answer to that. I believe Israel is in a state of martial law for decades. They sometimes have, you know, armed conflict, but not always. So what's the difference between Israel's case and Armenia's? If I'm not wrong, the case of Israel's legislation, they do not have a constitution, by the way. They, their mechanism of state governance is a bit different. They do not have a fully codified constitution. They have different basic fundamental laws, which eventually constitute something similar to a constitution, but they have more flexibility for this kind of situation. They do have, let's say, a lot of powers vested in the prime minister in Israel, but at the same time, there is a higher level of democratic processes and the flexibility of democratic processes than we have in Armenia right now. And the third justification against your argument, if I may, the situation is that in Israel, the war has never ended or passed to a body which would be a mediator. In the case of Artsakh war, we did not have martial law before September 27, 2020. We never had a martial law. I would like to stress this. During Levante Petrosian's presidency, which was the phase of active war in Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia did not have martial law. This is something very important. Okay. Mm -hmm. So martial law was introduced only on September 27 based on the following justification that there is a risk that attacks can transfer to the borders of Armenia. And right. you are much well aware that even if the borders of Armenia were indirectly tackled, we would have the opportunity to refer to the Russian Federation and to the collective agreement that we have for national security with the various post-Soviet countries. We never did that. I see, I see. Throughout this whole time, Armenia's government never did it. Okay, good to know that. Aram, uh, I'm going to go to the next question. So as you know, there are currently an unspecified number of Armenian prisoners of war being held in Baku. It is yes. literally, I think, a source of torture for many of us just to think about that, including the parents of those soldiers. The Armenian government so far has not been successful in releasing them, despite this being one of the points of the November 9 declaration. And meanwhile, also, the Armenian government is not releasing information to the media exactly how many prisoners we have, who they are, claiming this is a state secret. I know there have been different opinions on this uh, in the media, uh, but what is your opinion? Can the number of prisoners of war be a state secret? Can the identity of those be a state secret? What legal principles are at play here that we need to think about? The number of POWs cannot be a state secret. It's absurd. It's another example of absurdity that we see. This is not even logical. The number can never be a secret. The number has to be raised, by the way, for, for example, human rights organizations to raise the issue for society, the public in general, to be in direct contact with this issue. The Red Cross. This is Cross. something very logical. The Red Cross, etc. But this is not happening. The identities of these people, in my subjective opinion, can be held secret. The identities, the first names and last names, this can be a safeguard in order for those people, if Godspeed, we would have the chance to bring them back so that they will be protected in the Armenian society. They will not become, let's say, double victims. Because as of now, they are victims. 
As of now, they are in horrifying conditions. And I do not understand how can the Prime Minister of Armenia sign another document on January 11 and do, do, while not solving the issue of our Armenian POW. To remind our listeners, this is the document about the unblocking of uh, transport communications. And prior to going to Moscow, Prime Minister Pashinyan said that this was conditional upon the release of Armenian prisoners of war. And the chief goal of Armenia was to secure the release. But either that discussion did didn't even happen, or if that discussion did happen in Moscow between Aliyev, Pashinyan, and Putin, it was inconclusive. So from a legal perspective, and maybe I'm getting too much down in the weeds, what right is being violated by not releasing the exact number of prisoners of war? The situation is the following. The society has the right to be informed. This is one of the basic core democratic values that every country has to have, especially if they are considered a democratic country, if they have adopted this principle. And I would like to stress this issue as well. The society has the right to be informed properly. The society cannot be lied to. The government doesn't have the right to lie. The government doesn't have the right to lie from September 27 till November 9 about the situation during war. The government has the right to keep certain information, which are state secrets. For example, the amount of military power that we have, military objects that we have, military objects that we are targeting, the weaponry, etc., etc. These are state secrets, but the number of POWs can never be considered a state secret because, after all, we are talking about human beings. We are talking about people who, based on their decision, went to war, did not escape from the army, did not flee the country, but decided to go to war to protect their country. And these people deserve the right to be the relatives of these people, deserve the right to know the amount of people that are, that have the status of POW. Because by presenting the number, we can raise international and public awareness towards this issue. We can try to concentrate certain energy towards the issue. But I can tell you another thing. Do you know that up until now, we do not have an official number of casualties that we had during wartime. Can you believe right, this? Right. The government even did not disclose this information. So, of course, this government would also keep the number of POWs as a secret. And I can tell you that it's not something based on law. It's, again, something directly and only politically motivated. Aram, the last question, I don't know if you're privy to know the answer to, but I will ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that you interact with Robert Kocharian on a certain uh, cadence. Uh, I was wondering when was the last time you talked to him. Also, he has somewhat been involved politically since November 9. He gave a public interview where he welcomed the activities of the opposition group, also known as the Group of the 17. But mm -hmm. I wanted to know what is his level of interest and plans on entering politics again. I do not have any information uh, regarding that part. Of course, I am in uh, in systematic contact with the president. I can say that uh, as far as I see from people who I talk to, people who I am engaged with, a lot of people, a lot of, um, let's say, people who have different political views, I have not seen one opinion that, for example, if Robert Kocharian was the wartime commander-in-chief, that the result would have been the same. I can definitely state this. And after all, my statement regarding what I said is based on history, is based on historical facts. Robert Kocharian was the commander-in-chief in Artsakh during the most difficult time of the war. And we have seen the result that we have seen, which was victory in Artsakh war, a full and total victory. At the same time, now we see not the direct opposite, but something even worse, something much worse something even unexplainable. Because right now, we have a serious issue of security in Armenia. Of course, previously, during the last 30 years, let's put it this way, we had different issues. We had issues of corruption. We have issues of corruption even now. We have even criminal cases of the so-called new you know, people in this government, which are in direct contact with criminal cases regarding corruption, who are accused of corruption. 
Of course, we had different issues. We had issues at the judiciary. We had issues at uh, state bodies. Nevertheless, the issues of security and preparation of the military of Armenia were always high, were always at the highest level. But the situation that we had starting from September 27, this was a direct result of the policy that we have seen the last two, three years. After all, we've seen that almost all generals, people who have perfect wartime history during the first Artsakh war, were not only criticized by various NGOs on uh, people who have no background with the army, decided that they have the right to harshly criticize these people. But they did not stop there. They decided to criminally accuse these people. And after all, all those things would have a direct consequence on the army. And we've seen that. We've seen the result of it. Uh, and uh, I guess you should try to ask someone else about the political wishes of the president. I can definitely say one thing, that this whole criminal case against Robert Kocharan was purely and is purely politically motivated. I don't know why they decided to target Robert Kocharan, but maybe the answer behind this why can also be the answer to your question. Thank you, Aram, for your time. And thank you, our listeners, for your time. And talk to you soon. Thank you, Aram. Thank you. That concludes this conversation's ongoing episode. We hope it was helpful in your understanding of some of the issues involved. We look forward to your feedback, including your suggestions for conversation topics in the future. Contact us on our website at grung.org, or on our Facebook page, ann-grung, or in our Facebook group, grung-Armenian News Network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, like our pages, and follow us on social media. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.